So welcome to the Global Marketing Show. I am recording here from the Resi Conference in Boston. It's very exciting to be in person to record the Global Marketing Show that's sponsored by Rapport International. So this episode's tidbit is about down the street. So in Thailand, it's a common greeting to say, hey, where are you going? And the polite answer is to say down the street. So I thought that was a really good one. So today's guest, or this episode's guest, is Maria Kondratyev, and she is from Eterna Therapeutics, which is based in San Diego. So welcome, Maria. It's great to have you on the show. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's great to meet you. Yeah, it's nice to meet you, too. So tell me a little bit about Eterna Therapeutics and what you do. Sure. Uh, thank you. So um, we launched, we're a very young company. I launched it with a great team of scientists in San Diego um, about six months ago. However, they, well, our goal is to change significantly the way many metabolic diseases are treated, including diseases in pediatric space for kids that have gross hormone deficiency. For example, we have developed a completely novel way of more, efficient, more efficiently uh, treat this kind of patients. And um, I brought the idea with me from Canada, actually. So I moved from Canada to California about two years ago. And I was really blessed to meet a lot of great people to help me. And here we are right now fundraising and uh, meeting more great people to grow our team. Good. Okay, so tell me a little bit more about the therapeutics and what it does. So basically, the way I like to say it, we found a way to use antibodies the way nobody ever used them before. Uh -huh. um, what we do, there is a lot of uh, different diseases that result from our body not producing enough of certain hormones that have very short lifespan. So these hormones are produced and they cleared within minutes from our bodies, which is normally fine, but sometimes our bodies produce so little that the hormone doesn't have enough time to do its job. Like for kids, for example, with gross hormone deficiency, they simply stop growing the moment they, they are born. So typically how these patients are treated, they get injected every single day with a needle that contains the hormone made in the lab. And this works, these kids start to grow, but it's really difficult. Every day, every single injection, day, can you imagine? New baby, yeah. growth hormone. And how long does that last? You have to do it until puberty, more or less. And it becomes even more difficult in teenagers because they are embarrassed. Like, it's painful. They don't want to be injected every day. They want to go on with their life, you know, play uh, with their friends, travel. A lot of uh, families actually refuse this treatment. There is a huge issue. The treatment works. People don't want to do it. It's too inconvenient. It's expensive. And, and what painful. happens to the child if they don't get the growth hormone then? They grow very, very slow. So I actually have a good childhood friend who has two boys. Uh, one is eight and one is 15. She's being asked if those are twins. So they look exactly the same. And like, this is very, very embarrassing, embarrassing as you can imagine for the older child. So... It's an issue, and the way we uh, offer, we offer something completely different. So instead of using these daily injections, we offer to use antibody therapeutics where we generate antibody against this hormone. We make sure this antibody doesn't interfere with, with what the hormone needs to do. It simply binds to the hormone and the body and causes its stabilization. So we can extend half-life of this hormone from minutes to weeks. Hence, we can inject once a month. So this is a completely different story. Basically, this teenager can just go to the nurse's office at his high school, get the injection, and go on with his life being a normal kid. Right. Oh, and to change it from every day to once a month is yeah. life-changing. It is life-changing. And it's not like I, I gave you an example of gross hormone deficiency, but really there is a lot of different diseases, including oncology, uh, obesity, diabetes where we can uh, use this same concept. And we're going to expand there once we uh, grow a little bit. Yeah, oh, sense. Okay, and so what stage are you at now? So we are at early stage. We have 
first set of assets for the growth hormone deficiency that we generated based on collaboration with the uh, Toronto University, actually. And right now we are willing to move them forward. So we show that they work in mice. Okay. We have some early proof of concept data in mice. Now we need to make them into drugs. And that costs a lot of money. So this is basically where we are. We want to move them into drugs. We want to test them in monkeys. That's the next step before regulatory and before starting clinical trials. And in parallel, we want to start two new programs in metabolic space for similar type of indications. Okay. And since it's a show on global marketing, it sounds like you're going into marketing the company for fundraising at this point. Yeah, that's true. So tell me what you're doing to fundraise and where are you looking? Well, it's a lot of networking. And um, as I mentioned, I brought the idea from Toronto. Uh, and in fact, my first fundraising was from a Canadian commercialization grant. So I moved here with the goal to start this company. Actually, most of my life uh, was in academic institutions. And this is where Canada is very different from the U.S. It's actually, there is a great academic environment, a lot of great science, but not a lot of industry at all. Them. Not a lot. It's like mainly university, at least in Ontario. Like when you go to Quebec, it's a little different. There is more pharmaceuticals there. But in Toronto, it's very academic. So this is why this is, was, was my big push to move here to commercialize my ideas and to actually make drugs because there I got a lot of scientific support, but I couldn't really fundraise much. So I moved here two years ago to San Diego. I say here, but really, it's the, okay. the, 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 yes, the San Diego. The U.S., Boston, San Diego. Yeah. And the cultural environment there is completely different. Like, basically, you go to a brewery and you meet a lot of people who are all starting biotech companies. And all also such a warm climate in terms of well, warm overall, but also warm people-wise. Everybody starts helping each other right away from two seconds of a conversation. So people are very open. And it's a very community-based effort. So I immersed myself in that. That was very much a growing step for me as an entrepreneur. But then I went back to Toronto and I pitched, like I polished my idea into being something more com commercializable based on all of these great people I met in California. And I went back and I got $250,000 grant, commercialization grant, from, um, from University Health Network in Toronto to keep generating data. Oh, nice. So I think this, this collaboration between two countries actually helped, yeah. helped a lot, both countries, because like Toronto University got to get involved in such great project in a more commercially polished way. Uh, and of course, San Diego community got this great idea that was born in Toronto. So I think that's a good example of kind of, you know, international collaboration. Oh, it certainly is. Yeah. It certainly is. Yeah, Canada is one of the, is the biggest export partner that the United States has, and it makes yeah. sense with them. You know, yeah. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of Canadians uh, that actually moved to San Diego, a big community there. About and five so families of my friends moved with me. <laughs> <So> <laughs> Uh, uh, so, um, okay, so then you're looking to fundraise in the United States or would you go offshore to other? I areas? actually think that, so I switched four countries during my life. I was born in Moscow. I was raised in Tel Aviv. I actually, yeah. Oh my gosh. I actually had my undergrad and my master's from Tel Aviv University. Then I had my PhD and postdoc in Canada, and then I moved here, right? So I think I have an advantage, kind of, yes, um, from a lot of different people uh, that are fundraising, being born and raised in the U.S. in one state, because I'm open-minded in terms of talking to other people from other countries. For example, I made a great friend while actually interviewing for a job, funny enough, before I started to launch this company, uh, who is from Brazil. His name is Rafael. And he launched four different biotech companies in San Diego, and most of his investors are from Brazilian funds. And this is something 
that is a little bit unusual and like a lot of people who I talk to would have think to go collaborate with Brazilian funds. Yet I made this networking and we're actually having several meetings this week with his colleagues from Brazil. And in fact, we're connecting a fund in the US with a fund to Brazil for possible co-investments in our company and in future companies. How well. fascinating. Okay, so even though you might have more connections in Russia and Israel and Canada and the United States, you're actually talking to investors in Brazil yeah. for your company that was founded in Canada and is launching exactly. in San Diego. Exactly. So a lot of different <laughs> cultural things right. involved. Yeah. Yeah. And what do you what do you think some of the challenges are and benefits of looking international. I know a lot of uh, Americans, people from the U.S., I'm using American term generally, yeah. I know, um, are afraid to go cross-culture because they're, I, I, I don't know, afraid of the language or misunderstandings. Yeah. Yeah. I think, well, language obviously is a big barrier. And depending on a country, some, in some countries, the English is really good. In others, it's not that much, even in science and business. So definitely language barrier can be scary. I myself know four languages. So I think I'm less scared of, you know, communicating with a person who is not necessarily excellent in English because I know how to adjust to this. I myself was not excellent in English several years ago, you know, so yeah. you learn. But um but for a lot of people who know only one language and lived in one country their whole life, I think language barrier is a big thing. The other thing is just cultural differences. Like sometimes you're not sure how to talk to a person who was raised in a different environment. Like we know we smile, it means one thing. In other culture, it can mean completely different thing or like looking a person in the eye, right? We had this course during my MBA where they taught us a lot about how you know, some people can get offended when the other person doesn't smile at them, but remains serious, but it can be vice versa. From another culture, you can get offended if someone smiles at them because that's too personal. So have so. you run into those experiences? Yes, definitely. It's yeah, very, tell, me, tell me some stories. I love hearing them. Well, it, less so in San Diego because San Diego, I, I think, is less diverse, I would say. Uh, but Toronto is, for example, very multicultural. So in one lab, there can be people from 10 different places. Right. And I encounter that a lot. And uh, actually, let me tell you a story completely not related to work. I, we, we go out to to Chinese restaurant and I have visitors from Israel. And there it's less of a Chinese community than in Canada. And you order something and the waiter doesn't smile at you. And like, she's rude. Like, oh, she's not rude. It would be rude for her to smile at you. Because in their culture, you smile to your very close family or to your friends. You don't smile. It's impolite to smile to a stranger. So that's, right. that's so a good right example. You could see it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. now you definitely need to know different culture a little bit more and be exposed to them a little bit more to be comfortable. Yeah. So back to the language, you speak four languages. So I'm guessing English, well, I know English, Russian, Hebrew, Hebrew and, and French. It's getting away from me, but I studied French for about eight years during my childhood. Okay, okay. I was stumped on that fourth one. All right, and so if you don't speak the language, like if you're working with a Brazilian investor where you don't share a language, how would you handle that? Well, I think you definitely need a middleman in this case. I was lucky enough to, to make this friend, Rafael, who speaks both languages fluently, so he's connecting me with his community. But, but that's because... I think I was lucky and also, I'm, as I mentioned, I'm all very open-minded to connect to other cultures. But for many people, you definitely need some help and support from, from some kind of translation services. Or, but it has to be professional translation services, right? Because sometimes it's very difficult to just translate scientific terms from one language to another. And another example I can give you, my mom is also a, a scientist. A biologist, she passed away two years ago from cancer, but she actually was the one who brought me my passion to science for me. But she got all of her education in Moscow. So she speaks to me about things like PCR, which is like something that we see in the lab every, all the time. But she says, PCR, 
and I have no idea what she means. And every day she says it, I have to, oh my God, what did she mean? And it can even sound funny like this word. So you have to know, not only translate, but you have to also know how to translate professionally. I think that that's extremely important. Uh, or it's just going to sound a little gibberish. Yeah, we're poor international. When we've done patent translations, when there's no translation for the word, we have to work with the client to figure out whether we're going to come up with a translation, keep it in the original language, or come up with a brand new term. Or uh, yeah. well, it's not, that would be coming up with a new term. Or the other way is to give a longer translation that's more of a descriptor. Okay. Oh, that's really actually that's really interesting. Yeah, because that's true. Not every language has the same like word for the same. Or if it's a patent, it's something yeah. brand new that yeah, may not exactly. have been in that language before. So how do you handle that? So it's, yeah, the scientific terms, the technical terms, anything regulatory. Yeah, and so you were talking also about the culture. So now that you've operated in cross cultures, what are some suggestions you give to people that come from one country, one culture, and are trying to work cross cultures? Well, I would say read. Read literature, like read fiction. It helps. Oh, that's a wonderful idea. Read fiction books about that yeah. country, language, culture. Yeah. yeah. I actually said, like, when I met uh, as Brazilian people, I started to research what kind of books they read when, when they were growing up, you know, because yeah. I think we are all made so much Jesus. from what we were exposed to as kids in terms of books, in terms of movies. Like, it's all engraved in our brain, right? Yeah. So in order to understand a person, just become a person a little. Right. Right. Oh, yeah. So I, I think that's, that's great. Even watch Chip TV, sometimes that's helpful too. You know, I actually learned English. A lot of what I learned in speaking English was from watching TV show Friends. Because, ah. you, because you know, when you learn in class, you learn, you don't learn how people talk on the right. street or with each other. Right. right? When you yeah. watch TV shows, it's that you do. So. Yeah, I think just get immersed in their culture, in their day-to-day -day culture. That's really helpful. That's a good idea. Years ago, when my father was in Russia, he was in agriculture, so he was doing ag research. He visited Russia, and he was out in a farming community, and he happened, they, they took him to the theater one night, and he sat next to a young girl, and he spoke English with her. And here he is in the middle of farming community, Russia, speaking English to this young girl. And he says, well, how did you learn? And she, and she said, from watching American TV. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it was cool in Russia because they were not allowed to watch any American TV for a very long time. And then once they got exposed, everybody was watching it nonstop. So it, it was considered really cool. It was to cool. be able to it was, watch it. Yeah, yeah it was I'm so in, in the extra layer of motivation. Ah, okay. Well, he was surprised at how well she learned something. So that's a good idea. So read books about the culture and watch TV and understand the culture. Yeah. It's a reminder of not bringing your culture and your expectations into how yeah. somebody else should act, but okay. understanding how they do and adapt it. So how can we help you, you know, or what are you looking for at the Resi conference? Well, at the Resi conference, we're trying to fundraise, as I mentioned. So I was actually, uh, to the point we were discussing, I was actually kind of happy to learn that there are a lot of different countries represented from the investor's point of view. Yes. Uh, I've been to Bio uh, before, uh, in, in April, I've been to Bio in New York. It was more USA oriented investors. Here I see a lot of people from Europe, a lot of people from uh, Canada, a lot of people from Israel, Japan, China. So, so I think that's great. And actually, this is where those skills come handy, how to talk to people from different cultures. I have meetings for, for the next three days uh, with people from different countries every half an hour. So, you know, it's, it's not only you need to know how to talk to them, you need to be able to switch quickly. So expertise is yours. It's, it's very valuable uh, for such conferences, for sure. Yes, yes, at the conferences. And a lot of people here are English speaking. And there are a lot of investors from different parts of the world. And I was talking to the founder of Life Science Nation, who's going to be a podcast guest and the recordings coming up in a couple of weeks. 
And he was saying that that's one of the biggest mistakes that people in the U.S. make is not thinking about other countries where they might have a specialty research in a disease state or in a pathology yeah. and looking for investors there or in a population that might suffer from the disease state, you know, have a higher propensity for it, that there might be apt to be investors. Yeah, especially that. in the rare diseases. I mean, this is such an important field, rare diseases. And if there is one fund and it's across the world, it's important that we should be able to communicate that fund. Yes. Yeah. So any other suggestions about reaching funders in different parts of the world? Like you had a connection with somebody from Brazil. How would you go about expanding your international network for fundraising? Um, this is actually a very good question. It's not that easy. Yeah. It's not that easy. I guess going to conferences is one thing. I know Rising has several locations. Like I think there's one coming up in London. Yes, in London, they have one in Barcelona, and then they've got one out in the West Coast. Yeah, California. so that's, that's a great way to start, to travel. So it's, you know, expanding your horizons, travel. Yeah. I would say just do some research about different organizations, as you mentioned, uh, that is very relevant to your work in different parts of the world. Don't just put QS as a filter, you know, when you want to talk to people. People, yeah. Yeah, and then initiate conversations It might be... It might be tricky to initiate them, but at the end, it can be very rewarding, both for your company and for your personal growth. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this has been an absolute pleasure to have you here today and record this podcast episode with you. You've got such a, you know, global background and upbringing. I, I have a feeling you can transfer, you know, or transition between cultures very easily. And so it's nice to see. Yeah, okay. yeah, no, I've, I've been like, it was very educational. You learn more, a lot more from moving from country to country than from the green university. Right. 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 <laughs> Just honestly. <laughs> all right, so through all your yeah. travels and all your learning, you know this question's coming up. I always like to ask, what's your favorite foreign word? Okay, so you know, actually... And I like how you mentioned that you have this uh, way that you developed to come up with new words uh, that do, do not exist in a different language. So uh, Hebrew is a very interesting language. It's very unique because it's so old, but it also was completely on pause for centuries. And then when Israel started, it had to be revived. So a lot of words never existed. Well, when Hebrew language started, right? Because it started like 2,000 years ago. No, 5,000 years ago. So they had to invent them. And it was really funny for me to learn how they had to invent words. And some of them they brought from different languages. So they sounded a little bit like Russian, a little bit like English. And some they just came up with. So this word stuck with me. It's completely a random word, but it just sounds so funny. The word is kumkum. 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 And uh, it means a coffee maker. And this is just like so funny because like why kum kum? I don't know. It sounds funny. And I remember that because you will not find these words in a language that has stable history. So this is a word that it's like a child word, right? Yeah. But that you make up when you see something, not because it evolved by generation. That's hysterical. How do you say coffee in Hebrew? Coffee. That is a good word, and that is a new yeah. one. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I have here as a gift uh, the book that I wrote. It's called The Language of Global Marketing. Oh, thank and, you. And, um, yeah, and I really appreciate you taking the time for being here. Thank you so much. And thank you, listeners. And if you enjoyed this show, please give it a f five ranking and uh, pass it on to somebody that you know, that might be interested in learning about global marketing or have a business that could go global or is looking to raise, raise funds from anywhere in the world. Thanks so much. And we'll catch up with you next episode.